Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's been quite a morning for me already. Um, we had a fundraiser last night in Virginia Beach, and I don't know if any of you saw the weather, but it was storming. When I got home, my power was out, and it was out this morning. So I got dressed by candlelight. Luckily, the water in my hot water heater was still lukewarm, so at least I'm clean. So if my makeup and hair isn't quite usually how I look, give me a little slack here, because by candlelight with my almost 60-year-old eyes, I'm not quite as good as I used to be. Uh, but I, I'm Patty Lacey, and uh, I came to the association about 10 years ago uh, after caring for my grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease. I'd been faculty at Virginia Tech uh, for about 12 years when she was diagnosed. Uh, being uh, the one grandchild that was in the best position to move in and take care of her, I did. My last child had gone off to college, and uh, my husband was deceased. And I said, well, you know, I, I didn't know much about the disease, and I was fairly young and healthy at the time. I thought this would be a great time to spend time with Grandma and Grandpa. Had no idea what I was getting into. None. I got an education in a hurry. Um, and one of the things that led me and drove me to want to be in this position was what I did learn and how I came about that learning uh, in caring for her. Uh, it is a difficult road. Um, Douglas Panto, who is our community and educa education and community services coordinator here in Williamsburg, is your local contact for this region. He works with me. I'm, I'm located in our Norfolk office, but he is your person for everything up here in Williamsburg and on the peninsula. So I want you to get to know him and know his face. That's why he's going to teach part of this for you today, because I want you to become familiar with him, because he, he is really your ace in the deck of cards up here if you ever need help or need to find resources. How many of you are family members caring for someone with Alzheimer's? A couple. How many of you are professionals in the field? OK. Uh, how many of you are just interested parties? Okay, any diagnosed in the room? Brave enough to raise your hand? Oh, don't, don't be amazed. I get people with the diagnosis in, in, in my classes all the time. And with people being diagnosed earlier and earlier, it could be any of us in here who drove themselves here, who are still working and who are still doing their job in early stage Alzheimer's. The face of Alzheimer's is changing very much. If you noticed on our quiz, um, how many of you looked at the quiz? How many of you felt comfortable answering all the questions? You think you got them right? This is from a different presentation. Ooh. From a different presentation, but uh, I, it's always interesting to have uh, these questions because sometimes people, we think we know a whole bunch like I did when I went into it, but I, I really didn't. Uh, but one of the questions I get asked a lot when I go out into the community is that having a little bit of dementia as we age is normal. How many of you thought that was true? It, it's not. Dementia is actually not normal. Uh, we do have a slowing down of our brains as we age, but it's not normal to have dementia. Slowing down and dementia or Alzheimer's are completely different, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Uh, if you have memory loss, it means you have Alzheimer's. True or false? True? False. You got that one, good. If Alzheimer's runs in your family, genetic testing will tell you if you'll get it. That's false, okay. There is one very rare type of Alzheimer's called genetic familial Alzheimer's that it will tell you, but uh, it's a very rare form and there are only about 200 families in the world that have it uh, and uh, but that's not what we talk about when we talk about the millions of people that have Alzheimer's disease usually. There's no point in getting a diagnosis because there's nothing we can do. False. Good. Okay. You don't need a complete diagnostic set, set of diagnostic tests. You can just take some medicine if you've got memory loss. Okay. You guys did good. You guys did really good. Okay. Let's get started here. All right, Alzheimer's disease. I can't see my slide. One in nine older Americans will get Alzheimer's disease. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Because we are they, right? At least most of us. 
Kind of scary, yeah? If you're African American, you have twice the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease as a Caucasian. Why might that be? Any ideas? Well, part of it is a health disparity issue, okay? Uh, some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease include things like uh, hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol, untreated high blood pressure, diabetes, which are very rampant in the African-American community and often not treated. And those things cause residual damage over time to the brain, which can lead to an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. A woman has a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. The most notable factor for that is what? We live longer. And age is one of the biggest risk factors for this disease. So age is a risk factor. I've got news for you, though, ladies. We're giving the men a run for their, their money on this because we're starting to pick up all their bad habits they've had for years. We're, we're smoking, drinking, taking on high-stress jobs, doing all the things that they've done. And so we're going to be cutting our lifespan into the, the, the same level that they did. Our rate of heart attacks and other things are going up, high blood pressure, those kinds of things. So we're probably putting ourselves over time into that same category that men are in. So I expect that will probably level out. Five hundred. Five million people have this disease in the country. Every year, 500,000 people die. And that's probably underrepresented. Okay? Why would it be underrepresented? Got an idea? Right. The doctors don't diagnose it or on the death certificate. They die of complications. Yeah, they die of complications. Because Alzheimer's disease is not just a thinking disease. It's not just the memory. It attacks the entire brain. And when that happens, things happen like we end up in wheelchairs. We end up in the bed. We end up not swallowing well and aspirating and getting pneumonia. These things that, that take advantage of our weakened situation often lead to complications. And we die of the complications secondary too. So often on the death certificate, it will say that we died of something else or something else secondary to. And so the statistics don't often reflect what actually led up to that. OK. The number of caregivers, $220 billion, $17.7 billion worth of unpaid care. And that's just the unpaid care. That is a tremendous amount of of care that people are putting out. And if you're, if you're a family caregiver, you know what it's taking out of you. Mm -hmm. If you're a professional caregiver and you're meeting with the families of these people, if you're meeting with these caregivers and you're taking care of these loved ones, you just recognizing what these families are doing to care for these folks is just amazing. Some are losing their jobs. Some are losing their sanity and their health. I have buried a lot of caregivers before they're diagnosed in my 10 years in this job. And it, it's really tough, and it's really taking a toll on our nation. And as the baby boomers age and this number of diagnosed grows, the number of caregivers are going to grow, and we're facing a crisis in this nation. We really are. And so some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today may seem simplistic. What I want you to do with them, if you're a professional and you're working with either the families, there will be things that you can take home and teach to your families on how to deal with their loved ones. If you're a family member, there are things you can use with the person that you love. Okay, But the, there are things that we can all use. If you're working directly with the diagnosed, I hope they will help you in your dealing with the diagnosed. But I think the thing that we have to learn is that when you're dealing with someone with dementia or with their caregivers, having patience, understanding, and kindness are going to be the three most important things that you need. And I got that brought back to me in kind of an interesting way this morning, not related to dementia, but I was driving here from Chesapeake. And uh, I came up upon an accident on the interstate, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to be late. And I was all frustrated and mad. And, you know, it's all about me, you know. 
because it's all about me all the time, isn't it, really? Uh -huh. You know, and, and so I, I get up there, and as I'm going by, the first thing I see is this really young state trooper standing there, and he's got tears coming out of his eyes as I'm driving by. And then I look over, and there are two cars upside down, two people laid out on the pavement with, you know, one's in a head thing on a backboard, the other one they're working on, and I'm thinking, yeah, it's really all about me, you know. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, sometimes when we're dealing with people with Alzheimer's, with their caregivers who are stressed and they're taking it out on us, you know, we don't realize what they're putting up with and what they're doing. And that, you know, we're, we're the, we need to use a little more patience and realize it's not always about us. You know, sometimes people are in positions that they can't help where they are at the moment and that we, we're the ones that can adjust and take that step back. A person with dementia can't adjust, take the step back, and put more into it. Sometimes that caregiver that's been doing this 24-7 for months or years can't adjust, step, and take back. They just don't have it left anymore. And it kind of brought that message back to me, thinking it was all about me in my little car sitting in the air conditioning as I was sitting there thinking, Oh, darn, I'm going to be late. So uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the, the no number of years somebody can live with this disease, the average is four to eight. But people have lived up to 20 years. From the time of my grandmother's diagnosis now, and her diagnosis came years after it should have, because what did we do? We denied it. We were in denial. We covered up for her. She was a crazy Irish lady from Ireland, transplanted in this country, and so she was eccentric. We covered it up. We didn't deal with it. But she lived a good 10 years after the diagnosis. So that's a long time to be able to be patient and kind and loving and find the money and the resources and the help that you need. When we look at the amount of money and where it comes from on a professional level, you can see those are big numbers. Medicare, 113 billion. Medicaid, 37 billion. Out of pocket, 36 billion and 28 billion from other sources. That's just for Alzheimer's disease. When we start thinking Obamacare and other health care costs and everything, start thinking that it's 5 million people now when it's going to be 16 million by 2050 what those numbers are going to be if we don't find something to do about this disease. One in every five dollars spent by Medicare is spent for someone with Alzheimer's disease. So that's it for the statistics. I just wanted to set you a, an idea of how prevalent this is and how many people are dealing with it. So let's talk about what is age-related memory loss, because that will help us give, get a, a, a comparison to what dementia and Alzheimer's really is. Age-related memory loss, okay? We all slow down. We all have what we call decayed memory over time, but we don't all get dementia. A lot of it depends on how healthy we are, how stimulated we keep our brain, our overall health and function as we age. But it's normal to have a slowed down processing time, take a little bit longer to remember things, occasionally miss a payment, sometimes not be able to remember that thing you get the ice cream out of the box with, or that I like the white thing around your neck. <laughs> You know, but, you know, lose things time to time. But the difference is if I lose my keys because I rushed in because it was hot and my AC wasn't working and I had to get something to drink, uh, the next morning I don't have dementia. I can think, oh, I, I remember I was hot and I can retrace my steps. Someone with dementia is not going to be able to do the remembering and retracing the steps bit. Okay. The difference is things that you might be concerned about that are not typical with age related would be things like really poor judgment and decision making. We all make a bad decision every now and then, but Alzheimer's go and dementia go beyond just an occasional. 
it, it affects the entire brain. And so the entire decision making process might be wrong. In other words, getting up this morning and deciding we needed woolly socks and a coat to go outside. Okay? Or not being able to keep track of money when you were always able to do that very well. Okay? Uh, difficulty having just a conversation when you were always able to. All of a sudden, conversation becomes difficult. Uh, misplacing things, like I said, and not being able to retrace the steps. Putting things in odd places on a regular basis. My grandmother started storing her jewelry in the freezer and freezer things in the closet. So what is dementia? Okay, there are a number of kinds of dementia and what we have to do is, let's, let's go ahead and get the dementia versus Alzheimer's thing off the table right now, okay? All right, dementia is kind of like the group term, okay? Dementia itself is not the disease. Dementia means a cognitive problem, all right? It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, yep, you've got a headache. Yep, you've got a stomach ache. Yep, you've got a back ache. But he hasn't said what is causing it, okay? For instance, uh, you could have a sinus headache. You could have a brain tumor. You could have a migraine. But he hasn't said what kind. That's the same thing with dementia. He said, okay, you've got dementia, but he hasn't said, is it Alzheimer's? Is it Pick's disease? Is it vascular disease? He hasn't said what kind of dementia. Or the stomach ache, is it constipation? Is it an ulcer? Uh, you know, what's causing it? So dementia means he's recognized that you've got these symptoms, that they're real and it's enough to be a real problem. We've got it, we've defined it, but now we have to find the disease that is causing it. So dementia is like the descriptor term saying, yep, You've got the headache, now we've got to determine the disease that's causing it. Is it the sinus? Is it the migraine? Is it a tumor? And so when they say dementia, they're recognizing that you have the problem, but they haven't determined the cause, the actual disease behind that cause. And dementia comes in a number of different diseases. There are dozens of them, but some of the more typical ones, we have some that are reversible ones. And I'm going to put a caveat on that now because there's some new literature out that says in the elderly, even some of these reversible dementias may not be as totally reversible as we thought in some of the cases because often uh, the underlying cause when we reverse what was causing it, there may be some underlying dementia behind it. We get some improvement, but not total improvement. And we'll talk more about those. Vascular dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, and frontal temporal. And we'll go into some more detail on those. Okay, so what is it? It is a loss of functioning serious enough to interfere with your daily life. It's not the memory loss where I can't remember the word scarf or I have to think about a little bit longer and I check my work when I do my, my checkbook because I'm not as fast as I used to be, that kind of thing. And changes in memory, language, thought, navigation, behavior, personality, and mood. And, and that's one of the biggest things that's hard to get over is that, that Alzheimer's and dementia are not just memory. The brain encompasses so much more and this is a real destructive disease of the brain. It is, it's not just a thinking problem. We've got brain cells dying, and when brain cells die, the brain controls everything. This young lady is adjusting her ring right here. It takes millions of brain cells to do that. When those brain cells start getting destructed, it's going to be harder and harder for her to do that. That's just a simplification of what's going on in the brain. Some of the reversible ones that I talked about, medication interactions, overdose. Think about someone that's gone on too much of 
to, of some kind of uh, medication that uh, overwhelms them, or if you've had too much medication, can very much mimic a type of dementia. Uh, infections, tumors, uh, really severe nutritional deficiencies. We've actually seen this in Africa with children who have severe nutritional deficiencies show signs of dementia because their brains can't function because they don't have the nutrients that they need. Uh, eye and ear impairments that are significant. If you can't hear or see, you will show some of the same symptoms. Uh, depression that is severe enough can mimic uh, the very same symptoms of dementia. These are some of the ones that can be treated and get improvement from. Okay, the ones that we cannot, irreversible. Okay, as you can see, the big purple part is Alzheimer's disease. Okay, almost all, out of all the diagnoses that are the irreversible ones, when we talk about all the people that go in and they say, okay, it's dementia, we're going to figure out what kind, about 70% turn out to be Alzheimer's disease. The others turn out to be vascular is a big one. Vascular dementia is the one we used to think of as hardening of the arteries, mini strokes, that kind of thing. Anybody ever had that in their family? Yeah, we, we, I've had some of that in my, in my mother's family. Uh, Pick's disease, frontotemporal. So mild cognitive impairment. We used to think this was a, a lay step over in in the, on the way to Alzheimer's disease, and some still do. Mild cognitive impairment is uh, when we can detect a cognitive impairment doing cognitive testing, where we know that you're not testing quite normally cognitively, functionally, but not bad enough to say, uh, it's dementia. And so we know there's a problem, but the doctor's not really ready to call it Alzheimer's or dementia, but we know there's an issue. And about, it's split about 50-50 in the medical field now whether we say this is just a stepping stone on the way to Alzheimer's or whether it is just an, an actual diagnosis in and of itself. Uh, so it, it is an issue of concern to a lot. Uh, the other, the vascular dementia, uh, it's the second most common after Alzheimer's disease. It's very rampant in this country. Why? Obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, all lead to vascular dementia, okay? Uh, mixed dementia, this is very common too, and a lot of the cases that are diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease actually are mixed dementia. They're Alzheimer's mixed with either vascular dementia or mixed with uh, what we call frontotemporal or Lewy body dementia. Okay, dementia with Lewy body. Uh, we have some cases of that here. We're actually getting quite a few in our office, which has surprised me lately. Or frontotemporal dementia, it uh, affects more of the frontal lobe first rather than down around the hippocampus area. And so the starting symptoms are a little different, a little less in the memory loss area to start with, but more tremors, rigid rigidity, uh, uh, hallucinations, a little more of the psychiatric symptoms up front uh, than what you would see in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, the FTD or PICS disease, uh, it, it, it does progress much more quickly. We tend to see it in a younger age start than Alzheimer's disease, although we do have younger onset Alzheimer's. Uh, the FTD tends to to come very quickly and a lot of disorientation in this and a lot of uh, what we call, uh, there, there are pacers, the younger uh, folks that pace a lot. How many of you have had someone younger who was a pacer, like in their 60s and they want to pace and walk and walk and walk? They probably had FTD. Some of the others, crutzfield yakup is a, uh, what we call a prion disease. It's a protein that goes wrong. It's very rare. Uh, but this protein is, is not the same one that, that's implicated in Alzheimer's, but something happens to it in the brain. Uh, Huntington's disease is genetically inherited. Uh, how many, you, most of you have heard of Huntington's, correct? Okay. Uh, normal pressure hydrocephaly. 
Uh, we used to think this was curable. Now we know it's treatable. Uh, with a shunt, we can restore most function in most people uh, if it's caught early enough, but there can be significant damage if we don't catch it soon enough. And Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome is, are two syndromes out, actually. They're related to alcohol abuse. One is the chronic alcohol dementia where you've had alcohol abuse over the years and there's permanent damage from long-term use. And the other is more acute, the acute phase of alcohol use where you're having dementia at that time. So let's talk about Alzheimer's. It is a brain disorder, it is progressive. Progressive means we start with function here and over time function goes here until it's gone. Now it's not like this. You know, everybody thinks it's going to be this nice, slow progression. It's one of these, okay? And when you've seen one Alzheimer's patient one hour, one day, you've seen one Alzheimer's patient one hour, one day. You come back in an hour, they could be what seemingly a completely different person. Uh, so that is one of the challenges of Alzheimer's disease is you just don't know what to expect. It's most common, it has no cure, and it is fatal. No one has ever survived Alzheimer's disease. Okay, how the brain works. To understand how Alzheimer's works, you have to understand a little bit about the brain. We have trillions of neurons, and basically they communicate with each other, okay? Anything that affects that communication, and it's not just thoughts, but our emotions, our feelings, our ability to move, our ability to breathe, our ability to do anything that we do, to feel, to know right from wrong, everything is handled by these neurons being able to communicate with each other, okay? Two things happen in Alzheimer's disease. These cells, their ability to communicate with each other is impeded, and these cells are destroyed over time. So what happens? We get two things, okay? Two things are implicated. And one is called beta amyloid. It's a protein that everybody has in their brain, but something goes wrong with it in people with Alzheimer's disease. Instead of doing what it's supposed to do, it starts breaking up and clumping and forming what we call plaques, okay? These plaques start forming throughout our cells and they start interfering with the cell's ability to communicate with each other. And they start causing the cells not to be able to get all the food and nutrients they need and so cells start dying. When the cells start dying, the body does what it does best with dead cells. It gets them the heck out of Dodge. Okay, the second thing that happens, there's another protein. Think of a cell in the brain as like a little tiny balloon and it has to stay open and functioning. And to stay open and functioning, it has this other protein that holds it open called tau. Well, tau starts misbehaving in Alzheimer's too. And it starts tangling on itself. And when tau tangles, it collapses. And, of course, the little balloon cell collapses, too. When those tangles happen, those cells die. And, of course, when those cells die, the body does again what it does best. It eliminates the cells. So we have cell death happening. Okay. So as Alzheimer's progresses, we're losing cells. Yes, we do build new brain cells. We didn't know that until a few years ago. But we're building new brain cells, but we're losing them much faster than we can build them. And so over time, instead of having all this nice gray matter with just a little bit of space for cerebrospinal fluid, we lose gray matter and get lots of space for cerebrospinal fluid. So we can lose up to a half if we live long enough, of our entire brain matter with Alzheimer's disease. So that is a problem. So Alzheimer's is physically 
destructive on the brain. So it's not just a thinking problem. It, it's just as though it's been reached in and those cells have been taken out. So who is at risk? If you have a brain, you're at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Anybody not have one? Ah, we got one taker back there. I always have one smarty pants in the office. Right now, the biggest risk factors are age and genetics. Age, of course, we can't do anything about, and right now we can't do anything about genetics. What do we know about genetics? Right now, there are 17 genes implicated. Not causal, but implicated in Alzheimer's disease. What does that mean? That means if you have them, your risk factor is somewhat higher than someone that doesn't. Does it mean if you don't have them, you won't get it? No, ma'am, no, sir, it does not. The most common one that we know of and the one we know the most about is one called APOE. Okay? If you have one copy of APOE, your risk is slightly higher than the rest of the population. If you were unlucky enough to get a copy from mom and a copy from dad, you have a 50% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. Okay? That, that's how that one works. That's the, the worst case scenario for one of the genes that we know about is the APOE. If you got two copies, you have a 50% chance. But it doesn't mean if you don't have it that you won't get it. Uh, when we talked about the uh, one type, the familial inherited Alzheimer's gene, that particular gene is more of an early onset gene. If you have that gene and you inherit one copy, you will get Alzheimer's disease. You will get it about the same age that the parent you inherited it from got it. Uh, it runs in families and it's about 50% to 60% inheritable. And most families know when they have it because 50 to 60% of every generation gets the disease. I don't know if any of you have heard about the big study in Colombia where they have the huge family that they're studying with it, uh, the D Diane, D-I-A-N study. It's the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's study. Most of these people are getting this in their 30s and 40s. This is a very special kind of Alzheimer's disease, but it allows us to test some things that we would never be able to test before because we have a known population that knows exactly when they're going to get it, so we can test preventative things on them that we could not test on others. Secondary risk factors. These are the ones we can have some influence on. These are things that we talked about earlier. Remember I said blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, exercise, those kinds of things, weight. Those are the secondary risk factors that we have some influence over. What medications do we have? All right, the medications we have, and this is very important, do not treat the disease. They treat the symptoms. We have four. This first three are cholinesterase inhibitors, Exelon, Razodyne, and Aricept. They treat the symptoms. They help the brain cells that are there function a little bit better for a little while longer in some people. Okay? They do not slow down the disease. They just help function for a while. The same with Nemenda. It's just indicated for a little later in the disease. Same kind of thing. It treats the symptoms, not the disease. It's kind of like a, a headache pill it treat, or a sinus pill. It, it doesn't actually treat the disease, but it treats the symptoms. Okay, time for another quick quiz. Okay, Alzheimer's is not fatal. Okay. Only older people get Alzheimer's. Y'all are good. Memory loss is a natural part of aging. False. Okay. Cooking out of aluminum cans can lead to Alzheimer's. False. False? False. 
Okay. Aspartame causes memory loss. False. Okay. Uh, flu shots increases your risk of Alzheimer's. Okay. All right. Part two. We're going to talk a little bit about communication skills. Why? Because communication is one of the first things that breaks down. What, what was that? Oh, dental fillings, I'm sorry. Dental fillings, silver dental fillings, they cause Alzheimer's? Right, okay. There's, there's always been this question about everything that we can possibly think of and they get beat to death, so I always like to put them in there. But none of the studies that we have shown show any significant impact of those things. Now, if you consume enough of any heavy metal, it's going to cause brain damage. We know this, but the amount that you get from cooking in a pan or having a filling in your mouth is not going to cause Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk about communication. What is communication? All right. Communication involves a sender, a message, and a receiver. And communication is one of the first things that breaks down in Alzheimer's disease. And it's one of the first things that causes problems when we're dealing with someone with Alzheimer's disease. And it was, it's one of the more difficult things that families have to deal with. One of the things that causes more of the behavioral issues, more of the, uh, the emotional hurts and things that happen. It causes more of the behavioral issues because we can't understand each other anymore. Because the lines of communication break down. And so we have to really think about how we're going to communicate and when. If you're working with, with the client's caregivers, these are some tips and things that you can share with them. If you're working directly with the diagnosed, these are some things you can use to work with them. So what is the connection? The connection has a lot of pieces to it. It has language. Sometimes we have to, to modify our language to make it fit. What we have to realize is when we start losing our ability to communicate and bring words forth, sometimes we have to look at the words that we use to make sure that we are not overspending currency that the person we're working with doesn't have access to anymore. In other words, we, we may, we're not going to treat people like children, but we may need to bring our conversation to a simpler level, to a slower level. Uh, we need to make sure that there is a frame of reference for what we're talking about. People with Alzheimer's disease have a hard time staying in the here and now and, and getting their attention so that they can focus in on what you're doing. Everything is a distraction. They don't have as big a command of the environment as we do. So we have to make sure that we can get their attention. We have to look at the relationship we have to the person, the relationship of the person to the environment they're in, to make sure that, that they're going to understand how we're trying to communicate and what we're doing. And we have to make sure that emotions and feelings are not getting in the way. Because one of the things I can tell you is even when verbal communications break down, people with Alzheimer's disease are still very good at picking up on emotional communication. And I can tell you that if you're taking a meal in, say in a, a facility, and even if you've had very little verbal communication and you're taking in those pureed peas, and you go in with that industrial, well, hi, Mrs. Jones, come. Look, Cook made you your favorite peas. And you're smiling and you don't mean it. They're going to know. And they're going to be like, well, why don't you eat them <laughs> in their head? They pick up on that. They, they, they really are good at, at understanding the emotion behind it. They know when you're faking it. And so we have to work really carefully at being positive but being honest and keeping a real frame of reference that people can relate to. And sometimes that har that's hard. I know as a caregiver for my grandmother, sometimes I would have to walk out of the room and regroup myself to make sure that I could put on the right frame of emotional reference to talk to her so that she could get the message I needed her to get 
and not pick up the emotional reference that I was feeling. And, and that's really hard, especially if you're a professional caregiver because you know you have to do it uh, as part of your work. And you may be stressed, you may be in a hurry, uh, but the person you're caring for does not have the ability to adjust for you. You're the one that has to be able to adjust for them. Okay, they are not able to process our communication as fast as we can. We're used to asking somebody a question, a simple question, and being able to get an answer very quickly. Like, would you, would you like sugar in your coffee? We, we expect somebody to be able to say yes or no to a simple question. This may take someone much longer to process when they have Alzheimer's disease. They may not even get the question the first time. You may need to process and give more time. You may have to repeat the question because it may take longer for it to process. They have a hard time filtering extra noise. If there are more, more conversations or a television or the radio playing in the room, they may not be able to focus in on what you're saying and get the other stuff out of the conversation because they don't have the brain power and the ability to filter that out, okay? They need a very simple, direct message. If you make it too complicated and too convoluted or have too many messages in the same speech, they will pick up on one piece of it and what was in the beginning or the end will be lost. And so you have to give them time to process. And it gets frustrating because you may have 10 things you need them to do. But I can tell you something like getting someone to get up and go to the other side of the room and sit in a different chair may take you three or four conversations to do it. Because if you say, I need you to get up out of the chair and go over there and, move, and, and sit in that chair is, is probably too much of a conversation for someone that has that. I, just, just asking them to stand up is enough of a conversation for, to start with. It can be very difficult to carry all of that in one conversation. And people with Alzheimer's still have the feeling and the emotion, and they don't like to do things and be wrong, and they get frustrated. They still want to please and do the right thing. And it hurts their feelings, too, when they can't get it all right. And that's when you see them withdrawing and having behaviors is because they feel bad that they haven't gotten it, too. Okay, communication's challenging. The word finding, I talked about that, not being able to find the right word. Well, it can become even more difficult in that they start just stringing together nonsense sentences, but to them it makes perfect sense. And then they get frustrated when we don't get what they're saying. Or they're, we're talking to them and, and they're making sense of what we're saying, but they're not really getting our message. They're getting their version of our message. Repetition. Yes? I'm, I'm kind of under the impression that word finding difficulties is one of the things that is least specifically diagnostic of Alzheimer's and that lots of aging folks have that without Alzheimer's. Do you agree with that? Uh, a lot of aging people have word finding difficulty, but when you get into Alzheimer's, it becomes more than just word finding. It becomes almost word salad at a point, if you understand what I'm saying. Repetition. What time is it? You know? And then, what time is it? What time is it? Um, loss of ability to read or write or you will give them a book and they can read but then you realize they are reading the same page over and over or in the case of my grandmother she was reading a romance novel and the romance novel became real she was running away to marry the guy from Romania or somewhere, he was coming to rescue her and they were going to run away to Paris and get married. She literally packed her bag. She was ready to go. She was 
a young girl who was in love and this, it, she confused it with reality. She was in love with this man and was going to run away and marry him. And he was a character in a romance book. But then when she got to the part where he got killed, she was desolate, inconsolable at that point. They may revert to their native language, no longer able to speak English if English was a first language. And what I said, no clear sentences, inability to understand, and then complete inability to use words at all. Not, nothing but not nonsensical words coming out. Now I'd like to, to show you a short video here. All right, you'll have to watch this one because it's, it's not in English. Sound? Do we have sound? We need some. No, if we don't have sound, it's not going to work. Okay, well, let's just move on. We'll look for sound at the break. Okay? Let's just go back to the other one, and we'll look for some sound when we take our break, and we'll show it then, okay? All right. We'll, we'll look at the video at, at, after the break. All right. Inability to lose word. Okay. Douglas. All right. Douglas and I are going to... Okay, let me see how to do that. Testing. Testing. No? We're having technical difficulties here. Testing, testing. Oh, it works for the camera? But not overhead. <laughs> uh, can they hear us? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, all right, you get that. Okay, we have uh, a little bit of something for you. I am a caregiver Withdraw for my family member. I was a caregiver for my grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease. I was a field hobbies, medic at the time when this all happened, and, and sports, my family, because I was the only member of the family that had medical background, they decided, why don't you become her caregiver? I decided, why not take that? It was the hardest thing I ever did. It was the hardest decision. No? Yes. It's just a demonstration of how hard it is for someone with Alzheimer's disease when they've got all those competing voices. It's hard for them to just separate one out and hear. That's how, it, and just think a radio, another person, or if they go into a group, they don't have the brain power to pick the one conversation out and listen to it and hear it, not to mention the comprehension issues, how hard it is for them to just focus in on what you're saying. And so sometimes when we lose our patience with them and think, well, they should be able to understand what I'm saying, sometimes we're not looking at distractions and other things that might make it a little more difficult for them. Because to them, that's what it's like if there are other things in the room. They're trying so hard to focus in, but everything is a distraction. All right, there are lots of types of communication. And with people with Alzheimer's disease, we need to use all the tools in our arsenal. There's verbal and nonverbal. 
We need to use all of the senses. Uh, in verbal, there's the word choice, the sentence, the structure. Even slang can become an issue because sometimes as we revert and we lose some of our, our vocabulary, the slang things that we tend to think of are normal words are lost to people with Alzheimer's disease. I literally saw someone who was told to hop over here. Come on, hop over here. Hop. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not joking. It's, it's one of those things where we have to be careful what we're asking. And as we revert further, we may have to find out things like what kind of language was, was used when they were younger because they may not relate to what we're using now. Is it the potty? Is it the ladies' room? Is it the restroom, the washroom? What, what would be the best cue for me to ask them if they need to go to the bathroom? Because they may not cue on the right word if I don't have the right word to use. So we have to think about that. Nonverbal, we need to think about our body language. Are we going to walk up and tower over someone and intimidate them? Are we going to uh, get at eye level? Are we going to use touch to get their attention? Are we going to use touch to comfort? Are we going to stimulate their senses by having scent? Sometimes if, when you're trying to get, say you're in a facility and you want someone to go to the dining room to eat and they don't want to go, one of the easiest ways to do that is to bring something with you that smells like really good food. And so, say, hey, we've got some great stuff in the dining room. Because sometimes words are not going to do it. When we look at our communication, you can see 55% is body language. 38% pitch and tone, and only 70% are our words. So think about how important that is to someone who's losing their words. So it's so important that we think about the body language and how we're saying what we're saying. Making a positive physical approach is important. Making sure that we are approaching from the front. All right. Now think about someone who is not thinking well, who is frightened easily because they're not processing things very well, who still may be very physically robust, and all of a sudden you're walking up behind them and you're like, hi. You could get hurt. I, I have a, a friend who worked in the industry. She's retired now, but worked over on the peninsula for many, many years, and she was a smoker. And in their dementia care unit, they had someone who liked to go out and smoke once or twice a day. And she would take him out once or twice a day to the yard to smoke. Okay? And, and she, was, she was getting quite on in years, uh, Pat was. And she walked up behind him and put her hand on his shoulder to let her know she was going to take him out. He came around this way with his arm and hurt her really badly because he was startled. And so, you know, think about your own startle reflex, but think about it in someone who really is living in a world that's a little bit fearful. And so we need to make a positive approach from the front. OK? Go slow. Don't give people time to adjust to the fact that you're coming up to them, that you're walking up to them. Give them time to process that they might know you, even if they don't know you, to get used to who you are and that you're approaching them. Come to their side after you get there so they can still see you, but don't block their exit. You know, don't make them the caged victim that can't get out of their chair if they need to. You know, give them that you know, option that, you know, I'm not blocking you here, I'm not keeping you, uh, you know, and offer, you know, the, the, the universal sign of the palms up. You know, palms up, you know, we're not, you know, I'm here. And, you know, use their preferred name, okay? Every facility, every family, every group has their own cultural norms, norms. But when you have Alzheimer's disease, you want to make that person as comfortable as possible. If their preferred name is Pop, or if it's Bessie, or if it's Mrs. Jones, 
whatever their preferred name is is what they should be called. It was really hard for me because my grandmother would not respond to grandma after a while. So I had to call her Della because she wouldn't, it, grandma was not working anymore. But you have to learn to adapt to where they are because they're, they can't change. And so use what they would like to be called because that's more respectful than trying to be respectful by calling them Mrs. Jones if they don't want or feel comfortable or respond well to that. Okay, call the name they prefer. Talk to them as an adult. Now, the fact that I'm saying we need to simplify it into very short sentences and make it easy does not mean that I'm saying do baby talk, okay? These are still adults and they deserve our respect. They deserve their dignity. They deserve everything that they have earned in life. They are human beings just like we are. They are accomplished. But they're not little children that need us to talk like this to them. You know, they're still adults and they deserve to be treated as such. They just need us to slow down and give them time to answer us. Simple directions one step at a time. Make sure that they have good sight. Uh, when we use our five senses, uh, what I was talking about there is one, the touch is for attention. If you don't seem like you have your attention, if you think it's appropriate, a touch on the arm or the hand or the shoulder is usually uh, the easiest way to get their attention. Smell sometimes will enhance the experience. Uh, one of the ways I found if I, I really need to talk to someone, say if it's to calm them down, if they're agitated or something, uh, is a little hand lotion and a hand massage. It, it will actually, and talk to them about something that, that uh, they're interested in. Uh, if you're trying to get them to come to eat, uh, I found that a lot of people respond well to an orange slice, of all things, because the smell is something they remember. Or just a little, little bit of coffee in a cup. Hey, we've got dinner waiting. Something that they smell and relate to. Sight will, will help with attention. Hearing, rhythm, and motion. Sometimes if you, you get someone and you, you actually, you stand up with me, Douglas? You get them out of their chair and you're trying to get them to go with you, but they're kind of just standing there and they don't want to go. Start singing a little song or something like, Jesus loves me, yes I know. I can't sing. And the rhythm will get them going, something that you think they might know. You'd be amazed at how well it works. You don't even have to be able to sing because God knows I can't. But I would start singing some little Irish song or something like that my grandmother knows, and off we go. But some music or, in, or rhythm, something like that, connects on a different level. Use something like that, and, and that will start getting people moving along. Taste is tied to memory, but it enhances the perception of all other things. If you're, if you're reading to someone or something, and, and you're, you say you're, even something as my, my grandmother loved to cook, if I was reading to her out of a cookbook or something, and it had a couple of ingredients that were taste worthy, Sometimes I just read her recipes. I would have a couple of the ingredients there and we'd taste them and i go, I bet that would be good in there. Whether it was just vanilla extract or, or you know, some chocolate or something. And, you know, just anything to enhance all the senses while you're communicating. Okay. We're about to go on to behavior. I think now would be a good time for about a five or ten minute break. So okay. We're going to talk about behaviors now, and this is the one that uh, probably causes the most stress for families. Um, and the one thing I want to stress about behaviors, and I talked about that in the beginning, is patience. We talked, it runs thin with professional caregivers, it runs thin with family members, it runs thin with everybody. But like I, I said, patience, kindness, love. Okay, when you're in a room with somebody with Alzheimer's disease and something is going wrong, 
there is only one person who can change the situation and make it work out. And guess who that is? It's you. That person really doesn't have the ability to think it through and make things work. And so you need to remember that. Okay? And Douglas will be talking about some safety issues and things on, on what to do. And I'm going to talk about some basic things about behavior. A lot of times what we call behaviors are just the person with Alzheimer's or dementia trying to communicate something to us that they have not been able to communicate in any other way. And it's their frustration coming through saying, I need, I want, I something. And so now I am showing you in the only way I know how. Okay? It is often just an unmet need. I'm too hot. I'm too cold. I hurt. I don't like this. I'm afraid. And so they're trying to communicate something to us. So I want you all to do something for me now. <clears throat> I want you all to close your eyes. Okay? You're all at home in your favorite chair. You have had a wonderful day. I mean, just wonderful day. And you're sitting there, and you have whatever your favorite beverage is next to you. And you know you should get up and get ready for bed and go to bed. But you just want to sit here and enjoy a few minutes more of this wonderful day that God has given you. And so you do. And then all of a sudden, open your eyes. There is somebody standing there next to you that you have never seen before in your home next to your chair, and they're saying, come on, let's get your clothes off and get you to bed. <laughs> You're laughing, but would you really? Would you really? This is a position that many people with Alzheimer's disease find themselves in every day. Somebody that they don't recognize is in their space, whether it's their home or whether it's in their new home, coming up to them, asking them to do something that they're unsure of, that they don't think this person that they don't know should be asking them to do. It may be somebody they've actually known. It may be their spouse or their grown child or a professional caregiver that's been with them for years, but they don't know this person anymore. And they're asking them to do something that they don't think that this stranger has a right to ask them to do. Yes? Yeah. So that's the first time that you not recognize who are Yeah. And and so sometimes what we think of as bad behaviors are exactly what we would do if we were in that frame of mind in that situation. And so I I behest you to sometimes think about trying to put yourself in that person's position. What would you do in that situation? And then think, what can I do to help the situation? How can I make it a better situation? What is a workaround? How can I work around this? How can I make it a little bit better? How can I be gentler, kinder, easier for this? Because that, uh, can you imagine? That, that's a hard situation. Or to wake up in a room and see pictures on the bedside table and wonder who the heck are the people in the pictures. There's a lot of fear in this disease. And it's our job to try to take away as many of those fears as we can. All right, some common behaviors. Walking about. Now, I'm not saying all of these are bad behaviors or good behaviors. We'll get into that. But some of the, the, the common ones, walking about, exiting or trying to leave, wanting to go home, 
even if they're at home or in a facility that they've been in for a long time. Showing fatigue, sleep disturbances, rummaging and looking for things everywhere, maybe in other people's rooms if they're in a multi-home facility or in, uh, or in other places in their own home. Uh, gathering, shopping, uh, hallucinations, delusions, uh, suspicious or paranoid. I'll tell you one about paranoia. My, my grandmother got a set of pearls when she was confirmed in the church when she was a very young girl. And they were her prized possession her entire life. As this disease progressed, she got a little paranoid. And so she took to hiding things. Well, guess what? She forgot where she hid the pearls. Come time to go to mass, guess what? Somebody stole her pearls. Well, it had to be either grandpa or I, because of course we're the only two in the house. We stole her pearls. Well, guess what she did? She called the police. We stole her pearls. So it, you can see how tough this could be for family members to have these accusations flying. Things of you're having an affair. At, at one point, uh, my grandmother thought that the, the priest and I were going to bury her, take her house and her money, and run away. Um, and you know, you're, you know, and I laugh now too. But these are the kinds of things that that you know a diseased mind will come up with, and that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, loud vocalizations that may not be coherent, yelling, screaming, crying. So let's think of a different way of looking at some of these things. Whoops, it's not showing up there. All right, well, I can do it without it. A different way of looking at it. When we see people going through and say they're in a multi-room facility and they're going through and they're taking things from different people's rooms and bringing them back to their own, you might say they're stealing. Well, it might be a little lady who's shopping, who used to shop. She'd take her bag and she'd go and she needs toothpaste and she needs a robe. It, it's in her mind, she's just shopping, okay? People who are wandering around may be trying to go to pick up their kids and they're just looking for the right room at school to get the kids, you know? It, it's very difficult sometimes to put a label on a behavior as bad when we don't know the reason behind it. Uh, so how do we know if a behavior is bad, okay? Let's, let's just pick a behavior. Say uh, we've got a walker, okay? Say we're in an assisted care facility and we have someone who likes to walk day and night. And we've got a bedtime that we like to tuck people in, right? We, we want to get them in and get them into their bedtime because they need their rest and they need to get up the next morning. But they're a walker. Is it a problem? Is the behavior really an issue? They just for the staff. Well, it, for the staff, but I mean, honestly, if this behavior is serving a positive purpose for this person because they have this energy they need to burn off, then my answer would be is that the staff needs to accommodate the walking. You know, it, it's one of those things that we need to accommodate. Rummaging through drawers, you know, the shopping. What I would say is that's probably not a problem behavior. We just need to find a way to set it up so that she can shop in a safe way somewhere. You know, so that she has drawers and things that are safe for her to shop in because these are unmet needs. There are things that she needs to do to feel good. And so we need to look at the behavior and analyze it. In other words, if the behavior is not causing real harm to the person or someone else, then it is probably something this person needs to do because of something in their mind that they need to fill. Just because we have Alzheimer's doesn't mean that things don't come into our head that we feel like we need to do. 
And if we can help people that have this disease get those things done, they'll be much more cooperative for us. So if they need to walk or if they need a drawer to rummage in, that kind of thing, we need to try to set up ways to help people do these things because they are fulfilling to them. Even if we don't understand them, they're very fulfilling to the people that are doing them. And so we need to really learn about the person if we're going to deal with their behaviors because sometimes we do need to divert people away from potential behaviors. And we already know we have a communication problem, so we're going to have to find ways to get people away when we do have a problem behavior. And one of the ways that I find best is to know the person better than the disease. And that requires that we know about the person and the person's history. Not just their medical history and that they, you know, since they've gotten here or the year or two before that. I mean knowing stuff about their history, what they did in their life, where they worked, what they did for hobbies, the, the children, the grandchildren, where they grew up, where they lived. You need to have like a, a real history of their life and things they like to talk about, hobbies, that kind of thing. Because those are the kinds of things that are going to save your hide if you really need to get someone out of trouble. Okay? For instance, say um, Jane is at home with her husband who has dementia. Okay? Her husband has been retired for 10 years from the railroad. Okay? But he's forgotten that. So he comes bounding down the stairs, dressed to go to work. And Jane's not big enough to stop him from getting in the car and going to work if he really decides he's going to do it. But she knows he's going to be in trouble if he gets behind the wheel of that car and goes. Well, some of his favorite things to do are working out in their garden or going out to the park to feed the birds. Okay? And she knows this because she's his wife and she's known him for a while, but these are the kinds of things that other people in facilities could know. So he comes down and he's like, oh, I gotta get, you know, gotta get to work, gotta go, gotta go. And so what's she gonna do? She's like, okay, I've gotta find a way not to get him not to do this. And so she says, okay, Fred, but we, we uh, you're gonna need some breakfast if you're gonna go to work all day. So that's diversion number one. This getting to eat something, you know, you gotta have some food if you're going to work. You know, put some food down there. Food's always a good diversion. Get him to eat a little bit. And then get to talking about, you know, the birds, you know, I, or the squirrels or whatever he feeds out of the park. You know, I, you know, I saw this uh, there and we just got this new bag of feed. You know, why don't we go over to the park in a little while? Because the one thing we do know is that train of thought doesn't hold a long time in people with Alzheimer's disease. And so she's got this laundry list of things she knows that will distract him so if she can get him onto that thought process of doing something else while she's got him on diversion one, eating some food, she may be able to talk him into, after that, getting up and going to the park. And hopefully by then, this idea of going to work will be off the table. The same thing can work in facilities and other places. If you know the person that you're working with, have yourself this list of things you know that they like and that you know that they're interested in. Even if it's just an activity you know they particularly enjoy doing there, whether it be art or music or magazines or exercise or talking about what they did when they were in the war or whatever, something that you can do that you can divert them into that. Food is always a good one. If you know, Ice cream, I found, with seniors seems to be like the amazing thing. And I can see that because my grandmother said when she was growing up in, in Ireland, they didn't even have ice cream. But you have to realize they were what, we, what they called dirt farmers in Ireland, which meant they planted things by hand in dirt rows and, and really squeaked out of living there. But they, she didn't have ice cream until she came to this country. And so ice cream, all I had to do was mention ice cream, and my grandmother's eyes would glaze over and we were good. 
So, um, but knowing and having this list of things that you can try out and having, you know, just a, you know, if it requires supplies, having a little emergency box of whatever supplies you might need ready, your emergency box for that person if you need it, of things that you can divert with will save your hiney in some of these, in some of these cases. And that's what I'm talking about, redirection. We used to practice in this country what we call reality orientation. Okay? And what that meant was that people with Alzheimer's disease that got disoriented to what day it was, what time it was, where they were, and what was actually the truth, we had to bring them right back to ground zero. No, it is, what day is it? It's Friday, and we're in Williamsburg, and you're living in the assisted living facility, and your wife's been dead for 10 years. Of course you can't go home. Your children are off on vacation. You know, reality orientation. I'm going to give you the extreme example of why reality orientation is not kind. How many of you have lost someone really close to you, like a mother or a father or a brother or a sister? Most of us. And you remember before it happened how you felt, and you remember how, it ha how you felt after it happened, the grieving process, right? It hurts. All right? Well, think about poor Mrs. Jones, who has dementia, and she is sitting in the assisted living facility, and she doesn't know she's in an assisted living facility, and she wants to know when her mom is coming back so she can go home. Are you gonna tell her her mom's been dead for 25 years, and that she's not going home, that this is her home now? Because to her, when you tell her that again, that'll be the first time she has heard that her mother is dead. And she will grieve all over again like it never happened the first time. And if she asks you again tomorrow and you tell her tomorrow, she will grieve all over again like it never happened before. And no one deserves to go through that over and over and over. And so reality orientation is not kind. We have to practice kindness and love. And so the truth is not always the kindest thing to do. It, it, it is not a, I would, I would even say it's not a godly thing to do in this case. You know, when is mom coming? You know, my, my grandmother would ask me, uh, you know, when her sister was coming back uh, and we were at home and I was, and the only thing I could say to her, because her sister died when she was very young, and I would say, well, you know, sit, sis has gone to, to visit your brother. She won't be back for a few weeks. And most of that was true. Her, she was visiting her brother. They were both dead. <laughs> so, you know, it, but it, it would give her comfort to know, oh, okay, she's with my brother, and she would be comfortable and we would go on. But reality orientation is, is definitely not something that we want to do. Okay, it requires some detective work when we're dealing with behaviors. Sometimes, especially if we've got a repetitive behavior that we need to work on, we need to be detectives. All right, number one, we need to make sure we know who the person is. That, we talked about that. We talked about having that history and knowing as much as we could know about them. Second, we need to understand what the behavior is. Is it just aimless wandering around, or are they trying to do something? Are they going somewhere? Are they looking for something? When they're rummaging through drawers, is there something specific they're trying to accomplish? When does it happen? Is it the same time of day every day? 
Do they have that meltdown every day at the same time? Does something happen before it? Does it happen in the same place all the time? Does something happen that seems to trigger it? Is there a certain person or people around when it happens? In other words, we're trying to figure out what circumstance brings about the undesirable behavior. Okay, we need to figure out what it is that makes this person react this way. And if the behavior is there, is it something we can live with if it's not harmful, or is it something we need to figure out what in this chain of events that we can change that might prevent that behavior? Because sometimes if we do enough detective work and we figure out all the environmental, all the people, all the things going on and what they're trying to accomplish, if it's something we really need to stop, we can figure out something along the way that we can change, whether it's environmental, people, or whatever, that can change it just enough to alter that chain of events so it doesn't keep happening. Okay, that's what I have. We're going to let Douglas talk to you for a little while about safety issues. You remember Douglas here, right? He hops and skips real well. <laughs> Um, right, this doesn't, you can't, can you hear me in the back? If I talk real loud like this, you can hear me. Okay. Um, just a little background on me. Uh, I, all, I too was also a caregiver for my grandmother who had Alzheimer's disease. At the time, I was a field medic in the military. I was stationed at Langley. And we started getting calls about grandma. She was acting erratic. Uh, of course, my family, we chalked it up to she's getting old. This is what old people do <laughs> when they get old. They, they act a little differently. Her memory wasn't as well. But then she got picked up for shoplifting, very out of her character. And so we knew we needed to do something. We needed to, to, to find out what's going on. We got her tested, and the doctor said it was Alzheimer's disease. Well, since I was the only family member that had medical background, they all pointed at me and said, well, why don't you take this on? It can't be that hard. I said, sure, why not? How hard can it be? I'm a field medic in the military. I can do this. Come to find out it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, I will admit, I wasn't the best caregiver. I made a ton of mistakes. And a lot of it was because I didn't understand the changes that were happening to Grandma. There was a lot of changes that were going on that I just could not understand. For example, when I first started caring for her, she recognized me as her grandson. She knew who I was. I felt good. As the disease progressed, it got to be where I was no longer her grandson. I became that guy. That hurt. And I would always try to remind her, I'm your grandson. I am your grandson. And she would look at me and go, no, you ain't. <laughs> As the disease progressed a little further, it got to the point to where I was no longer that guy. I became the bad guy. I was the thief of the house. She always thought I was stealing her pocketbook, when in actuality it was her hiding it from me and forgetting where she put it. I became the kidnapper because... I wouldn't let her go outside without supervision. I was scared she may wander off into traffic or get lost or, or, or put herself in a situation where she wasn't safe. Got labeled many, many different things and the stresses that were involved with that. Um, it was very frustrating. And there was times where I lost my cool <laughs> at times. I said some choice words that I wish I never said but it was due to the frustration. And there were times where I had to back off, count to 10, try to reintroduce myself, and ended up backing off and counting to 20. And, and there was times where I just backed off and I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. This is where safety issues can come in play, um, especially for the individual. What I did learn about my grandmother and what had happened was, uh, about the disease and with the help from the Alzheimer's Association and also from support groups was the changes that were going on with my grandmother there was reasons why the things were happening the reasons why she was acting the way she was behaving the way she was 
And the way it was explained to me is, uh, try to imagine life as a rainbow. At one end of the rainbow, you have birth. The colors of the rainbow are all your memories, everything you ever learned throughout your lifetime. Um, and it starts from childhood, goes on to grade school, high school, college, getting married, having children, all the way up to your elder years. When you're stricken with Alzheimer's disease, those memories slowly start to erase, starting from your elder years going back to childhood. So my grandmother's short-term memory was, was going rather quickly, and it wasn't there. She couldn't remember the doctor's appointment yesterday. She couldn't remember who I was as the disease started to progress. And it got to the point where she didn't have any grandchildren, that she didn't have children. It got to the point to where she didn't even get married, and she was a young woman. Some of the safety concerns that I had with her, um, I found out when she looked into the mirror, she scared herself. Because in her mind's eye, where she was at on her rainbow of memories, she remembered herself much younger. Who's this old person staring at me? They keep staring at me. When it comes to, um, uh, as the disease started to progress, my grandmother had one of the, um, she had depth perception issues. And she, the proximity of things, it, it was very hard for her to determine just how far or just w where it was. And this made tripping um, and, and falls very prevalent. And I, I noticed it, and, and some people may have seen this before, is watching her walk over a threshold, she would always take a high step over that threshold. And the reason why, she couldn't determine whether it was a step up or step down. And so she always overcompensated. And it's often true when you see that, that happening, that's where the, the falls risk come in play. Shadows were playing tricks on her. The, she would see the, that as um, uh, uh, a wet spot on the carpet and try to avoid it. And sometimes the furniture that was around the house would make it odd for her to try to wander around and avoid those things. Um, I was a bachelor at the time, and I didn't have a lot of foo-foo decoration in my house. <laughs> I, was, I had the basics, my chair, TV, PlayStation, the necessities. Um, <laughs> my bathroom was a plain bathroom. I had white walls, white tile on the floor, white toilet seat, white sink, white bathtub, white shower curtain, white towels, white soap. When it came to the caregiver and I to try to get grandma to do uh, do her ADL care in the bathroom, um, cleaning herself up. We had a hard time with it. Took me forever to figure this one out. Um, it wasn't until someone actually told me she probably can't see anything. There's no <coughs> color contrast. And so I was a cheap bachelor, and I went to Lowe's and got a can of red spray paint. <laughs> spray painted the toilet seat red. Oh my gosh, it worked. She can see it. She was able to sit down. So I got a little spray paint happy, did the sink, did the tub. It worked great. My bathroom started to look um, decorated. <laughs> <laughs> I even got the toilet paper with the little blue flowers on it. It worked, she was able to use it. I got soap that she could see, nice shower curtain. I even spray painted her shower chair because it was white as well. And I spray painted that. Oh, sh she can see it, she loved it. I started thinking safety. Okay, I got this white floor. I got to do something about it. Let me get those mats that are those the carpet that you can put um, in, in front of the, the bathtub, toilet, and so forth. Even the non-stick mats that you can put on in uh, in the tub. And I figured, since I already have the red and white, why not get blue and just go red, white, and blue? So I got this dark blue, navy blue, and then we had problems with that. And it wasn't until later on, actually the caregiver brought it up and said, well, she probably thinks of it as a whole, and you have to be careful of that. And I was like, ah, duh, okay. So I had to get rid of those, and I ended up getting a, a neutral color. And you can guess my bathroom looked god. <laughs> it, I, I, I was not a good decorator. but. It helped, and it was doing those little things that helped. And it helped uh, when it came, it, it became easier for ADL care when it came to uh, dealing with my grandmother. 
Um, being called a thief, her pocketbook, that was one that, that really hurt. Because here I was, I was trying to do good by caring for her. I was there for her. And for her to call me a thief and call me those names, that hurt. That really hurt. But I got smart. And I learned this from a gentleman at a support group where he told me, go out and buy five pocketbooks exactly the same style, color, make, model. Mimic the items inside. Strategically place them throughout the living room. And when my grandmother would say, you thief, you took my pocketbook. No, grandma, it's right here. And I'll pull one out, give it to her. She would run off and hide. Hour later, you thief. Oh, no, grandma, it's right here. I'll pull out another one, give it to her. <laughs> She'll go off and hide that. Of course, when she went to go take a nap, I would have to go try to find all the ones she hid so I can put it back. And it relieved, after a while, it relieved it. She no longer called me that thief. And we were able to do that, that this that activity over and over, and it, it made me feel a little better, and actually, the humor of it made me feel better as well. Um, but there are some safety risks that you have to look at. Okay, let's see if I can get this right. One is abuse and, ne and neglect. My grandmother thought I was an abusive caregiver, especially when, in the morning, I would pull out an outfit and say, okay, Grandma, we're gonna, let's get dressed. We have the doctor's appointment to go to. We need to get dressed. At first, I would open up the closet and say, okay, which outfit would you like to wear? She would look at me and say, I'm already dressed, and she's still in her nightgown. So then I would pull out an outfit for her, and I would say, okay, we're going to wear this. And then I became that bad guy forcing her to undress and wear an outfit she did not want to wear. And she would say I was abusive to her. She called 911. <laughs> called 911 and said, this guy, he's being abusive to me. And it just laid it on thick. Oftentimes that can happen. Sometimes it can be the abuse performed by the family member due to frustration. Um, there's been some cases where Family members that were caregivers said, I can't take it anymore. I am, and there was actually, there was one case here in the United States where one family member pinned a $20 bill on them, took them out in, the, in a rural area and dropped them off and was like, good luck, I cannot deal with this anymore. It happens. It happens. It's due to that stress. It's due to that frustration when it comes to caregiving. Um, there's physical neglect, psychological, financial, sexual. You often hear about some of those. Uh, you have just won $10,000. Please send me $3,000 so you can get your $10,000. Um, there's a lot of that fraud going on. Um, and oftentimes, it's individuals with some form of dementia being taken advantage of. I live here in Williamsburg. And in my neighborhood, there was a case where this elderly woman, about 79 years of age, living by herself, her husband had passed away. She always had a landscaper come and mow her lawn and take care of her lawn for her. And he would come about once a week. And she would pay him with a check once a week. Then he started coming more often. He noticed that... She, there was something not quite right there, but he started coming more often, twice a week. She was paying him every single time he came by. Eventually, the family started noticing her money um, being spent. And so they, they caught the gentleman that was taking advantage. And, and it, over time, it was close to over $5,000 this person got from this woman just for uh, uh, coming by and, and mowing the lawn. So. People do take advantage of individuals with dementia. It can occur on, on behalf of either party. Social services and APS should be called for that um, so they can do their investigation to find out um, uh, what needs to be done. When it comes to emergency services, Poisoning and choking is, is one that you have to be very concerned with. 
overdosing on medications, especially those that are newly diagnosed and they are, are self-medicating and they see the pill box, they walk by it. They, oh, I need to take my medications and they'll take their medications. Go off in the living room, do whatever, come right back. Oh, I need to take my medications. Take their medications again. They can overdose on their medications. Um, ingest toxic chemi chemicals. Um, you have to be careful about those decorative soaps. They have soaps that look like cherry juice, smell like cherry juice, even come in a cherry juice looking bottle. And um, it can be enticing for the individual. So you have to be very careful, have those things locked up. Um, falls, tripping, stairs, and shower stalls. Uh, again, that debt perception problem. Sometimes the, uh, 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 the different colors or patterns that are on the rugs and, and, and things of that nature can also cause problems um, when, when it comes to individuals with the disease. Burns, electrocutions, they lose that sensitivity of hot and cold. They, they can't, and also that sense of pain too. They may recognize that, okay, something's not quite right, but they're not quite sure exactly what it is. For example, when a person um, with dementia, sometimes when they, when they are beginning the phases of incontinence, they may have that full bladder. And you and I know when we have a full bladder, that means we need to go. A person with dementia, especially Alzheimer's type, they may have that full bladder and they recognize that is full, they recognize the sensation, but they don't remember what it means or what I'm supposed to do about it. And the same thing when it comes to pain, they may recognize that sensation, but they, not, they can't connect what it means and what it's about. Um, having a headache, they just cannot connect that it's a headache. They just associate that there, there's something not quite right here. And so there might be behaviors that happen because of that as well. Accidental fire, when it comes to cooking, my grandmother almost blew up my kitchen. She thought my microwave was a toaster oven. Toaster ovens, you're allowed to put metal in. And so you have to be careful when it comes to cooking. Individuals with the disease, they may turn on, uh, they're, like they're, they're, turn on their gas stove like they're gonna cook something, and then their mind starts to wander onto some, another subject and not realize they just left it on. Trespassing, walking into the wrong home. Um, a home that may be similar or what's in their memories, in their mind. My grandmother, as her memory started slowly being um, reverted back into time, she was remembering uh, the house that she grew up in, which had a porch and a swing. And of course, my house didn't have a porch and a swing. <laughs> um, so it, it wasn't her house, it, and she would always make sure she told me about that. Wandering. Wandering is the scariest thing. They say six out of 10 individuals with Alzheimer's will wander at one point or another, and you're not gonna know when it's gonna happen. Um, I lost my grandmother on several occasions. One time, shopping at Walmart. I was looking for her size of blouse on the rack. When I turned around, she was gone. She was in the parking lot, checking all the car doors. Um, she was trying to get away. Why? I was the bad guy. I was the kidnapper. But wandering? It can happen in a moment's notice. But there are tools out there to help when it comes to wandering, um, such as our Medical Alert Safe Return Program. It's an ID bracelet um, that individuals wear. We, we tell families, make sure that your loved one has some type of ID on them. Because most times when individuals with Alzheimer's, when they wander, they don't remember, ah, oh, I need to take my wallet with me or my pocketbook. When they get a chance to go, they're gone. So make sure you have some type of ID on them. And usually the medical alert bracelets um, work well when it comes to that. Plus you get 24-hour um, emergency response. Uh, it, it's, it's a hotline. Um, and we often tell caregivers to also, especially when it's a spouse caring for their loved one that has the disease, to also have some identification. Identifying you as a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And the reason why was there was, a, there was a case that happened in Chicago where this gentleman who was caring for his wife who had Alzheimer's, um, when she took a nap, he decided he wanted to go grocery shopping while he, she was napping. On his way to the store, he got into a car accident, ended up in a coma. The hospital did exactly what they were supposed to do, try to call and see if they can get family. 
Um, she had Alzheimer's disease, she didn't answer the phone. She was at that point in her disease where she didn't answer the phone. So he went 11 days, when he finally woke, woke up, he started asking my wife, my wife. My wife's at home, she has Alzheimer's disease. They sent someone to go check on her and they ended up finding her, but she was near death. You imagine, she, didn't, she went 11 days without food, water, medications, um, and, or incontinent care. So you can imagine the state that they found her in. So we tell family members as well, have some type of ID on you that specifies you are a caregiver for someone with the disease. We also have um, other tools out there such as GPS tracking, which can be great for individuals, especially now in the techno technological <laughs> uh, uh, era that we're in. Um, GPS tracking can be great. The problem with GPS tracking though, it'll tell you that the person's in this building but it won't tell you where in this building that person's at. So there is some search that's involved. But GPS tracking, especially with our comfort zone program, it's a great program because you can set up parameters. For example, in this picture here, you see they have a day zone and a night zone that's set up. So anytime that person was to cross that zone, it would automatically alert family members and let them know, oh, this person's on the move. And then they can track them. Um, it also, the person is automatically enrolled in our safe return program, so they also have an ID bracelet with them at, at the time. So this tool is available and it is out there. And it has all the alerts, low battery alert, um, they entered a zone or e exited a zone. Um, there's even a panic mode uh, that the person, if they're still in the early stages of the disease, can also press and, and alert the family, look, I'm, I don't know where I'm at, I'm lost. <laughs> Um, can you help me? But there's a lot, uh, the technology nowadays is great and, and there's a lot that this um, comfort zone can be very helpful with. Now, many of you probably heard of Project Lifesaver is another tool that's out there and it's available through our um, local police department. And it is an actual tracking device that it sends out a radio signal and the officers are able to track down that radio signal with a, a special wand. Um, and it, it's a great tool uh, also, and it is available out in the community. And if you want more information about those items, on that last slide, there are contact information that's on there. Um, and even the websites for our Comfort Zone and our Medical Alert Safe Return program. Oh, that's it. Thank you.